Where were you when you heard the news that David had been attacked? I was in my office. I looked on Twitter and I saw this extraordinary report. I, I felt a sense of disbelief. Um, I was a member of parliament for a, an Essex constituency. I got to know David very well as a member of the House of Commons. We were on the same side in the Brexit debate and we both represented Essex coastal towns. And um, I was just absolutely stunned and appalled. Um, it is a, a truly grim and horrific day. What were his qualities? Tell me about his personality. I mean, was he humorous? Was he argumentative? What kind of guy was he, Douglas? He always smiled and he often talked quite loudly and he always mentioned his constituency. Um, I, I know that politicians like to think of themselves as being good representatives of their constituencies, but he really was always in the mode of promoting and representing his constituency. He was also a, an unfailingly cheerful man. I, I remember during the turmoil of uh, the, the Brexit referendum, he was always unfailingly cheerful and always very optimistic. Um, he was the sort of person that an effective democracy needs to have. He, he didn't become prime minister. He, he didn't become foreign secretary. But you need, in a parliamentary democracy, people like David Amos who fulfill that role of being representatives of tribunes of the people. And I think he was far more, you know, far more, uh, parliament is far richer for having people like him serve in it. And the idea that a man like him can't go about the ordinary mundane business of meeting with his constituents on a Friday in October in Southend-on-Sea because of, we fear, terrorism. I, I, I think that is an extraordinary thing and a quite unacceptable thing and a, a deeply revolting thing. And I think we need to look beyond the warm words that we're going to hear and look beyond the emotive comments on Twitter and ask ourselves seriously as a country, what is it we intend to do? Do you think that politicians face more peril than you did when you were in the House of Commons? I, I don't know about that. I, I never experienced anything remotely like this. I, I did have one or two incidents that were a little hair-raising. I, I was once mobbed by a group of people, but nothing, nothing like this, nothing in this league. I mean, here we have what seems to be a, a terrorist attack motivated, some would suggest, by Islamism. Although, of course, the British state and British officials are going into that evasive mode of not actually reporting, leaving it to people to read between the lines. We're told that it's being led by anti-terror people. We're not actually being leveled with. Um, I'm reminded of what happened when someone called Ahmed Hassan tried to commit mass murder in Parsons Green, or when Kahari Sadala murdered people in a park in Reading, or indeed more recently when there were homophobic attacks in Birmingham. Officials in the British state never actually spell out the nature of what it is that's happened until much afterwards. We, we're hearing euphemistic mentions of searching for possible mental illness. I, I, I hope that at some point the public will expect British officialdom to be honest with them and to level with them. It seems as if one of our representatives going about his ordinary business as a democratic representative may have been murdered, it looks like, by politically motivated Islamism. And if that is the case, we owe it to our government to be honest with us about this. Because if we're not honest, it will happen again. Well, again and again and again, when atrocities have been committed, police officers and British officials and the British government have been evasive. You literally have to read between the lines of what the mainstream media and the BBC and others report in order to get a feeling of what actually happened. Now, I, I, I may be wrong, and I, I, I hope I am wrong, and I, I hope it turns out not to be the case, but it seems as if someone inspired by a radical creed has committed a grotesque murder, and somehow our officials don't have the courage to spell out what it is that's actually happened. All this talk about searching a, a man's mobile phone for possible signs of mental illness, 
I, I think it's time that we had a government that was actually honest with us. Here it is that uh, one of our 650 representatives in the House of Commons, a man that was elected by his constituents to represent them, appears to have been murdered by what appears to be a politically motivated Islamic fundamentalist attack. Now, I may be wrong, but if that is the case, we owe it to officials to at least be honest with us and define the nature of the problem. It is deeply disingenuous for the British state to continue to be evasive, as they were after Parsons Green, as they were after what's happened in Birmingham, as they were after what happened in that part in Reading. We at least, I think, owe it to uh, democracy and to the institution that David Amos represented to have honesty from British officials as to what exactly happened and what exactly was the motivation behind this murderous attack. I couldn't agree with you more, and let's hope that that, that, that levelling up with the British people, that levelling with the British people happens uh, very rapidly. Of course, my panel have pointed out we need to make sure we've got all the information, uh, but that ought to be uh, readily available, as you said, uh, Douglas. The sooner we get to the truth, the better and stop treating the British people like children who can't be trusted with the responsibility of what actually happened. Um, Douglas, tell me about how Brexity he was. I mean, there is a Brexit spectrum, isn't there? So was he brexit light, or was he a sort of undiluted, full-fat Brexiteer? He was a very positive Brexiteer. Often we think of Brexiteers as being quite dogmatic. He was very affable, very outgoing. He wore his Brexit credentials proudly, but he he had a, a whole spectrum of interests. He was he was passionate about a whole load of things. Um animal welfare. Um he was passionate about um healthcare. He was passionate about a whole range of things. Brexit was certainly one of those things. Um and it was, you know, it was I remember once inviting him to come and talk to some of my constituents in Clacton at a fundraising event. And um it was a big crowd on a windy day. And um, everyone who was speaking, myself included, needed a microphone. He had such a wonderful voice and such a loud personality. He was the speaker who could address this throng of people on a windy day without, without a, a, a megaphone. And I think that just sort of sums him up. He was, he was very positive um, and uh, very, you know, very animating figure. Um, it, it's it's a, Douglas, almost you... disbelief that this could happen. Well, well, of course. Now, you surprised everybody by leaving the Conservative Party, resigning your seat, and rather courageously uh, fighting the by-election that ensued as a result of your resignation, and you were returned as the first elected MP for UKIP. Did your relationship with David change once you'd left the Tory party, and did he try to talk you out of it? No, not really. I mean, when I when I changed party, I I got a very positive response from pretty much every Essex MP because I think every Essex MP understood that actually the public wanted change. And um, you know, on the fundamental question of Brexit, whether you were in UKIP or whether you were a Conservative, or, or that matter actually, whether you were members of the local Labour Party, fundamentally, I think uh, on this issue, a lot of Essex folk were on the same side. And um, you know, on, on, on this issue, I think um, David and, and I and indeed most, most people in Essex were as, as one. Yes, well, uh, I'd like to bring my panel in if I can, because we've got uh, Suzanne Evans, Brendan Shilton and Ella Whelan with me as well, Douglas. And of course, Douglas is live in Mississippi in the United States. And uh, I think it's worth sort of checking in on... Um, the wider legacy, Douglas, of David, because although he never made it to the cabinet, he made his presence felt and achieved a lot in his almost four decades on the back benches. It's proof that you can change the world from those green, well upholstered seats. He, he passed some legislation on issues that were very important to him, uh, a couple of bills on, on animal welfare. Um, I think one of my abiding memories of him and one of the big impacts that he will have was his his victory in 1992. Um, he was one of the first politicians, I think, who had a brand that was much bigger than his party. And I, I, I think many of the people that he represented knew him as an individual. And to me, as a, a, a young MP, that 
was that was pretty inspirational. He was known as David Amos, first and foremost, as a Tory MP, second to that by his local constituents. And I, I, I think I think um, he sort of set a trend that I think others others have tried to follow. This creation now, of a first constituency brand. Douglas, you are in the United States. You've gone on to have a glittering career stateside. You're the president and CEO of the Mississippi Center for Public Policy. And uh, I want to ask you whether this story will be reported in the United States, or is it being reported? It is being reported. There are not many issues that happen in British politics on a day-to-day -day basis that have cut through, but this, this has cut through. Um, it's been reported on many media outlets. People that I met over at lunchtime, um, people who've never been to England had heard about this. This has cut through. I think this is one of these moments when people understand that you know, the world outside is, is you know, a, a bad thing has happened of, that will echo around, around the world. Well, yes, Ella Wheeler, this, this attack, as, as Douglas hints there in his, his answer, uh, it sort of goes beyond these shores, really, doesn't it? Any, any democracy should be in mourning today. Yeah, I mean, the, we have seen the issue of the health of public debate and the way in which we interact with each other suffer, not just at the hands of the isolation that came into place during the pandemic, but also there's been a problem with the way in which uh, we politically interact with each other, the way in which, um, you know, politicians feel slightly, even the, all the praise we've given to Amos, there is a wider problem with politicians more generally about being uncomfortable with uh, dealing with, as Brendan put it, the rough and tumble of democracy, the rough and tumble of the public. Um, and there, you know, we don't know any details about this individual and their motives, and I think it's very wrong and dangerous to jump to any conclusions, even if latterly you are proven wrong or right. Mm. Um, but there is a question about a sort of underlying sense of, of nihilism in politics today, which is that it is bizarre that people reach these murderous ends, but it is also bizarre that people, um, as Suzanne mentioned, feel the need to go to extremes such as spitting in the faces of politicians or chasing them down the street, shouting at them. I'm all for a very you know, hearty and robust uh, political debate, and I think that politicians need to accept that sometimes they're going to get unkind words thrown their way because not everyone's uh, always very eloquent in the way they express their politics. But there, but there's something to be addressed about the way the health of political debate. I think in part it has to do mm -hmm. with censorship. In part it has to do with a kind of shallow interaction with politics. And there's something else going on about a kind of fatalistic outlook with people thinking that they just jump to an extreme like this. And, of course, this is slightly different. A murdering an MP isn't a horrific abnormality. People don't go around doing that all the time. But a conversation about the health of democracy um, beyond the UK into other countries is very welcome. Uh, Suzanne, uh, this is something of a UKIP reunion for you and Douglas. <laughs> yeah, my old boss. Hi, Douglas. Hope you, you look fantastic. You look very well. Oh, he's, he's gone to America. He's making a fortune. <laughs> <laughs> but, Suzanne, I mean... It, <laughs> you do wonder, don't you, Suzanne? I mean, it, you know, who'd be an MP in 2021? Well, amazingly, there are still lots of people queuing up to do it. Um, uh, you know, we've got plenty of political activists, plenty of people that want to do the job, plenty of people that want to take on that on that mantle. Mm. Um, and, and that, I think, is a, a credit to the nation, really. Mm. Um, as I said earlier, most people go into politics, the overwhelming majority of people go into politics because they want to make a difference. That's why I went into politics. I know it's why Douglas went into, into politics. It's why David went into politics. Um, and you do it because you have a vocation, really. It's like going into the church, I suppose in that sense you feel that you have a job to do you feel you can do that job and you do your damnedest to make a, a good fist of it um, and, and obviously sit, sitting on those green benches I'm sure Douglas would, would agree is also something of a privilege um, and, uh, and and it's an achievement and you can make a difference even from those back benches, as, as, as David quite, quite clearly did, and as Douglas did, you know, um, defecting to UKIP, standing for re-election, that made a massive difference to the, the whole Brexit debate, uh, forcing David Cameron to offer the referendum, which, of course, the Leave side won, and here we are now having left the European Union. That wouldn't have happened without the courage of people like, like Douglas and also Mark Reckless, who, who, who also did the same, the same thing. So... 
political life is difficult, it's tough, it's adversarial, uh, I sometimes think too adversarial, I think that's part of the problem. Um, and I know a lot of people might be put off going in, into politics for all sorts of reasons, but ultimately I think it's one of those things that pulls on your heartstrings and there comes a point in your life when you just have to do it. What do you think, Douglas, um, if you had the option of entering the House of, Common, the House of Commons again, if circumstances were different for you, would you do it? Well, I really only went into the House of Commons to get Britain out of the European Union. Mm -hmm. There were lots of other things I enjoyed while I was there, not least... Um, Clacton and representing Clacton in Parliament. But um, the only way I would ever stand for public office in Britain again is if, um, for some reason, Britain was to rejoin a supranational, um, undemocratic uh, club. So well, long as we are yeah. a governing country, I'll, I'll quite happily watch other people do the governing. Uh, Brendan Chilton, you are, of course, a Labour borough councillor for Stanhope Ward in Ashford. You're a Labour man, and this isn't about political persuasion, isn't it? It's not about Labour, Green, Tories, Lib Dems. This is an attack on our politics. It is indeed. Uh, a Conservative MP uh, was murdered today. Uh, five years ago, well, just over five years ago, mm. a Labour MP was murdered under similar circumstances going to her constituency surgery. And it, it really is something where... Britain, I think, around the world has got a reputation for being a sort of moderate, reliable, sound country that's a bit jolly, a little bit arcane in certain places, but we all get along. And to see, within the space of five years, two politicians being brutally murdered, mm. uh, really, I think, is... We're starting to see a sea change. I think, as Ella and, and Suzanne have both touched on, the politics of this country is becoming so polarised, so divisive, and social media really does escalate that. And I think all of us, people who are campaigning, politicians, in journalism, everywhere, I think we do now have got some responsibility to try and moderate and come back to that sensible, calm politics that this country was always famed for. Of course, robust debate. Politicians should be heckled. They should be challenged. They should be uh, facing angry crowds in halls and in meetings, because that's the nature of our politics. But when it gets to a situation where, as Suzanne said, 600, I think you said 600... 87. 87 yeah. uh, crimes against MPs or attempted crimes, the threats on social media, the abuse people receive, and now these two murders. I think we've got to have a hard look at ourselves as a, a country and our politics and say, is this really where we want to be and the sort of politics we want to project around the world? And I think hopefully uh, this is a disaster that's happened today. It's terrible, but hopefully we might get a sea change in how our politics is conducted, uh, especially as we've had two murders so closely together uh, in the past five years. Welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favourite shows and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.